Alrighty, here's a little countdown. I think this is episode 26. Today, I'm very excited uh, to be joined by Professor Jeff Byers at Boston College. What's going on, Jeff? We're talking a little bit beforehand, but how are you doing? How was your uh, your winter, little winter break good. vacation? It's been good. It, it's it's good to be back and starting a new semester. And mm -hmm. you know, how cool is it up there right now? It's not mm -hmm. so bad. Uh, we had a little yeah. snow uh, earlier in the week, but it's all melted, and you know, it's not it's not terrible. Usually, it's much yeah. colder than I'm here. <laughs> No, you're not knee deep in snow yet, or is that? Nope, no. Nope. February is the month. It's a big one. Yeah, that, that's we get a lot of snow usually in February. Yeah. So, I guess the first place I want to um, start with is uh, you're actually originally from Las Cruces, New Mexico. Correct. Did I pronounce that's that right. correctly? Las Cruces, um, New Mexico. That's right. That is like ten miles north of El Paso, but I think what well, like more like sixty miles. Is it sixty miles? Yeah, more like 60 miles. Okay, all right. All right, so it actually is really far up there. But it is well, close to the, the white sand. Well, you know what's going – well, two things. One is what I'm realizing about, like, the – I guess you could say southwest air region is 60 miles is kind of nothing because it's mostly just, like, highway. So it's, yeah. like – six like but in the northeast, 60 miles is, like, That's pretty true. long. That's you know? true. Um, yeah. Texas but it's, is a big state, so – yeah, it's so fourteen Mexico for that matter. So yeah, um, so sixty miles really isn't a big deal down here. But I mean, I fly when I go home. I usually fly into El Paso and then drive mm -hmm. uh, drive out El Paso to Las Cruces. Yep. But it's also very close to that White Sand National Park, which I don't really know how popular it is, but I have seen videos on social media of like surfing. So surely yep. you've done that in your growing up times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A hundred times. It's a weird thing because it looks like it's snow, and then you look at the people and they're in shorts and stuff because it's like a hundred degrees it, outside. So it's an oh odd, man. it's an odd picture, but it's a really uh, neat sight. Uh, White Sands also is the emergency uh, land. It used to be the emergency landing spot for the um, the, the space shuttle. So oh wow, uh, you can see White Sands from space, and so if they they have issues getting into Cape Canaveral, um, they. Uh, or sorry, Edwards. So they normally go into Edwards. They land. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they go to the Cape um, where they take off if they can. But if they can't do either one, they go to White Sands. And that's because of the, well, the, the, there's a base that's close by. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but also they can see White Sands from space. And so it, they, it only landed in White Sands once. But I remember when that happened and it was pretty neat uh, to yeah. see the space shuttle kind of cruising down the highway. Yeah, that's so cool. And now is it like a big town? Like, like you know, Las Cruces is the second yeah. biggest city in New Mexico after Albuquerque. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, was it not, by? That's not saying much. It's like a little. I think the census. I don't know what the most recent census is, but mm -hmm. I think it's like one hundred and fifty thousand people or so in Las Cruces. Okay. Moderately, because yeah. I know I can't, I, I I see White Sands um, National Park a lot, like on social media. Like people, like it's like. Um, it's like the trope of like, where do you need to go when you're a broke college student on vacation? Like that's, you know, it's like, that's where you go and to go explore the sands. Yeah. So it's really good. cool that you're from that area. Yep. Um, now then, so you grew up there. Um, how was, you know, how was like the diversification down there? So I don't know, like if there's a huge, like Mexican population down there. Sure. Um, most of it's interesting. Most of, uh, my friends in, in high school were Hispanic, so mm -hmm. I was a minority in my high school, uh, mm -hmm. which is a very weird thing to say as a, a white male. Um, but uh, there, I, I also, since I lived close to a, a, the base, White Sands Missile Range also is part of the same White Sands area. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of kids that were kind of coming in and out, and so... Um, there are a lot of African Americans that were part of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sons and daughters of um, Army and, um, and Air Force, uh, you know, members. Yeah, they would spend a couple of years and then they would be shipped off somewhere else. And so mm -hmm. we had a kind of a rotating group. But I would say the majority of people that live in that area are white or Hispanic, and a little mm -hmm. bit more Hispanic than white. Really cool. Now, do you still have family that lives down there? Or? Yeah, my mother lives there. I just uh, got, came back from visiting my mother. Um, oh, nice! It was cool. I gotta get. I gotta get over to New Mexico. I was here. Uh, you should very underrated state. I think. Wow. 
but it's it's definitely beautiful it's a uh, a lot of different things to see especially if you like the outdoors uh mm-hmm. the southern part of the state's very different than the northern part of the state um, is it, are there are there um are there like um native american that's the reservations there? are there like a lot of there like... yeah culturally very diverse in terms of the mm-hmm. uh, people there's uh in the south there's a lot of influence from mexico as you mentioned but also uh, native americans in the west and the north east and west mm-hmm. so the northern part of the state has more of a native american influence than the southern southwest part of the state where i'm from also las cruces is the southwest part um and so yeah you get that influences the the culture and also the food a little bit and so sure um, what were some of your favorite meals oh i mean mexican food in in, in new mexico is the best in the country in my opinion Fair uh, enough. because of that kind of blend of uh uh native american mexican food mm-hmm. is just like an ama- amazing combination and also hatch new mexico is right there and that's mm-hmm. the, one of the best places to get chili in the world and so you know growing up in las cruces the right time you can smell the like roasted chilies and stuff and as you're walking down oh, the it's amazing a so, good yeah, chili, I, like, man. I like i like enchiladas and chili rianos and um all that stuff is fantastic uh, mm. uh so i got my fill because in boston not as much of that <laughs> as in- i can attest to that i grew up in i grew up in the suburbs of philadelphia so the, the okay. northeast is which is you know a great area but i could attest that the mexican food just doesn't stand up to i think obviously new mexico but even in houston too like i mean the yeah. tex-mex is real the real influence um but i even say like mexicans it's probably a top three food group for me like fruit that's number one for me about uh because it's kind of like home food for me right so yep i mean i can eat it for breakfast lunch and dinner like that's how serious i am about it like (laughs) it's very good we could hang Um, for sure yeah uh so you you know you grew up in uh las cruces um but you did your undergrad at uh washington university in st louis um so can you tell us a little about you know that you know moving from you know new mexico to uh st louis um because you also got your uh, bachelor's of arts in chemistry there, not in science. So I'm very curious about, you know, the differences, um, and why that was. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, so at Wash U, I, everyone gets a bachelor of arts degree. Mm. Um, and so it's because it's a liberal arts style education. So, um, you have to take a, you know, different, uh, distribution requirements, we called them, uh, for mm. t- different classes. And that's actually one of the reasons why I went there, is because I wasn't sure what I was going to major in when I was going to college. So um, I had a lot of interest in uh, English literature, so classic literature. So I actually have a minor in in English literature mm. uh, and well, my major in chemistry. And so I was looking for schools that had, you know, good science departments, specifically chemistry, and also good literature. Uh, and and WashU was one of them. Um, and so, you know, I didn't really know much about Washington University. I think Speaking of underrated schools, I think WashU is an underrated school. Mm. Uh, a lot of people don't know about it uh, still, which is kind of amazing. And uh, I, I didn't really know about it, and and they recruited me pretty hard. So they, I just got a lot of flyers from them, and I learned about the school. And my dad and I visited the school, and um, you know, kind of really enjoyed the atmosphere at WashU. Mm. And I, again, I didn't know what I was going to do. And so that provided me with uh, some flexibility, a little bit more time to kind of figure that out. And so it was, it was kind of a no brainer. Um, you know, it was, it was a, except for the cost, right? So it's this private school. And so sure. growing up in New Mexico, I, I, I could have gone to New Mexico state or university of New Mexico for free essentially. Mm-hmm. And my dad's alma mater is New Mexico state. So, um, but you know, um, I wanted a little bit of a different experience and um, living in the Midwest certainly was that. So that was, you asked about what was it like? That was a pretty big culture shock for me Mm. moving to the Midwest as well as a very different weather for the first time. So New Mexico, Southern New Mexico has great weather uh, almost all year round. It's a little hot in the summer, but other than that, it's great. I was going to say like St. Louis is a city. I feel like I and it's like like, a big city so compared to where i'm from so because like you're like the i don't know you're like the eighth person i talked to in the last like year that has like been to st louis lived in st louis and it's like but living in the northeast i'd never heard anyone from the st louis area and so 
apparently that's also a very underrated city too i, I know um, yeah st louis is awesome i i love living in st louis um it's a it's a pretty cheap place to live uh so mm -hmm. all all the like you were talking about inexpensive things to do a lot of the things in st louis are free so they they have a big park called forest park it's actually bigger mm -hmm. than central park in new york city oh wow and in the okay. park in the park it, it has a whole bunch of different things there's like a zoo and an art museum and a history museum and a science museum and there's a some there's a playhouse that has plays in the summertime and all of that's free so you can go to it, that for free anytime you want um which is was pretty cool at least it was free when i was in college so mm. uh, so it's it really and then I, i'm a big sports fan so okay blues uh, and cardinals yeah cardinals especially right uh it's a very big baseball town so uh you kind of it's kind of cool if you're into uh especially baseball the the town really cares about baseball yep. it's, it's uh it's definitely it's huge unique. and they're i think they the second most winningest baseball club that's right I after think, the right? Yankees, right, the Yankees. Yeah. that's right I, I know it's huge pride and the blues i think won a stanley cup not yeah, there it, it's three a, years it's ago also, maybe yeah that's true i mean the hockey it's not it's an underrated hockey town i would definitely say i think everyone under knows it's a big baseball city Mm -hmm. But it's also got a pretty strong hockey uh, presence. Influence, and, yeah, for sure. And, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they've they the Blues have been around for a very long time, and yeah, it's it's pretty big. And and it's a two sport town now. You know, the when I was in college, the the Rams were there, and they yep. famously left to go back to LA. I was gonna say, where do you stand? They on lost that their second football team, so I don't think that St. Louis is ever gonna get another football team. They didn't <laughs> football. They might get basketball. Um, that I could see being a potential, uh, uh, wasn't place. there a basketball team there? There it was, wasn't... yeah. It was a basketball team in the ABA. And, uh, when the ABA folded, the, I think that's also when the St. Louis team okay. left. Cause who were, was it the Seattle St. Louis, Sonics East St. Louis became the a, Oklahoma city thunder? I don't know why I confuse those sometimes. No, no, no. East St. Louis is uh, on in the Illinois side of, cause you know, St. Louis is right on the border of Missouri mm -hmm. and Illinois. And um, I think that oh. com combination East St. Louis and St. Louis would be good for a, a basketball team. So yeah, I would, I would sure. root for that. I th I'm sure the St. Louis fans would be excited about that too. Yeah. Just going back on your washing, uh, wash you experience though, is you, you mentioned you got a you know minor in English and mm -hmm. um, actually the first professor that first, like at least like STEM professor that is really pursued um, a minor in English. So I'm very curious about your, interest in uh you said classical literature um first of all i don't even know what that means like classical literature so i don't know like is that a time period a type of literature yeah. and yeah my wife says that i like to read books by dead people <laughs> okay so, you know all like right. i don't usually read too much contemporary literature okay. um and that's not because i don't like contemporary literature it's just that time hasn't filtered out um the bad stuff yet so fair enough yeah probability of reading something that's not great is a lot higher when you read contemporary literature versus the stuff that has survived the test yep. of time so i i don't i i enjoy that and and um and so that so yeah i really enjoyed reading the classics and and um thinking about you know my set my my favorite class in college actually was my shakespeare class so oh okay a lot of chemistry class so not, not, nothing against my chemistry teachers they're great but uh, I really enjoyed the Shakespeare class as my favorite. And uh, I enjoyed like kind of thinking about and mm -hmm. analyzing the the literature. So well, I think certainly... a lot of people ask me why I decided to go into chemistry rather than yeah. English, which may be something that your viewers might enjoy hearing about. And I, <clears throat> and this is something that I think is important. Um, what I was told growing up that, uh, and in fact, you still hear this, that there are two types of people. There are creative people and then they are uh, the scientists, right? And so, sure. In fact, you hear people saying it's a creative endeavor, and uh, they're they're referring to something in the arts usually, right? And so, mm -hmm. I view myself as a creative person, and uh, I was like, I I need to go into you know a creative endeavor, and so English literature was something I like to write too. So, I thought, oh, maybe I can be a writer or or something like that. More recently, I've been getting into film, so I might have ended up being like a filmmaker or something like that, mm -hmm. um, ultimately. But um, when I got to college, I took gen general chemistry and from a professor who just retired named Bill Burrow. 
And mm -hmm. he was talking about not just the experiments for some of the um, key, uh, you know, effects in quantum mechanics, but also mm -hmm. like the thought process behind how these experiments were developed. And it, and it finally occurred to me, like the amount of creativity that exists with designing experiments. Sure. So we're not really taught that in high school. Like when we, when we learn, you know, physics and chemistry and biology, it's taught very factually and not from a, the standpoint of, hey, people had to figure these things out and people had to kind of come up with a way to probe these kinds of things. And so I realized that once I realized that there was a lot of, of creativity associated with uh, the sciences, um, that coupled with the, you know, huge potential for getting a job after mm -hmm. coming out of college. And then on top of that, I had, I, I did research at, at NASA, uh, after my, uh, sophomore year. And then I started it at, it in lab with Karen Woolley, uh, who was at Washington university at mm -hmm. that time. And now is at Texas A&M, um, I got, I got, I got the research bug and it was kind of a no-brainer for me to kind of follow the trajectory towards a, a chemistry major but um i don't regret i mean i, I had it, like i said i think my the skills i acquired by taking all the english classes i did in college still benefit me mm -hmm. um, but i do kind of regret that I, it took me so long to realize that 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 there's a tremendous amount of creativity with in, with science and, and scientific mm -hmm. endeavors <clears throat> and i and i kind of i kind of bristle when people say uh, uh that they when they talk about creative uh uh, uh careers and they don't sure. include the scientists and the engineers so. yeah i definitely uh i think i mean i think one of the biggest pitfalls is especially in like you know middle to high school is like you're we can attest it as like uh, teachers teach it as a fact and um i feel like one common thread people that at least go into the STEM fields is that they always had a professor or teacher that was like kind of opened up their eyes to it because they're able to teach it in this kind of creative way. And I can definitely speak to that where it's, you know, I had high school professors that were got you thinking critically, but also outside the box as a scientist. And, you know, traditionally speaking, we're not taught that way. So yeah, there definitely is room for improvement in the STEM fields is thinking outside the box. Like it's not, doesn't have to be so factual and some of the biggest breaks, this is so general, but some of the biggest breaks in science is because, um, you know, you, oh, you can't do that or don't do that, or this is not going to work. And you're just saying, Hey, screw that. I'm going to go try it. And yeah. is it working? Yeah. So, so I think you're, we're starting to see more and more of that, uh, in, in the form of like outreach programs, for example, mm -hmm. um, I'm part of this NSF center for integrated catalysis. And okay. one of the programs that we offer for uh, uh, high school students is something called Catalyzing Exploration in Chemistry, the okay. CXC program. And what this is, is, is we're, we, we, we have kits of um, experiments that we send out to students um, that are either in the area of sustainable materials mm -hmm. or in the area of renewable energy. And basically we have, we don't have like specific instructions about what to do. We have a kind of guidelines about what, what, what they should be doing. But the idea is that we want the students to kind of tinker around and come up with their own ideas and try to figure out, you know, we, we say, well, you know, how, if you, one of the projects, for example, is we give them uh, uh, different plastics and, and we say, well, de degrading plastics is difficult. Can you figure, you know, try to come up with a way to degrade plastics what what different ideas do you guys have and they come up with some very creative things and uh they they are very resourceful and and so um that's a really fun pro program that we're actually going to start again soon so you know maybe i can give you the link and you can post it um absolutely it so that if they have any i mean yeah there, we, there, there is there, there is a up. need for there is a need for us you know the next the next generation of scientists and i mean hundreds of thousands of them across america that just need the the push or like they just need something and then they're ready to go and so yeah, yeah that's an excellent I think things like this is going to be great too like this is a great thing uh for people to see that you know and so the internet has been fantastic for for reaching more people than when mm -hmm. i was in high school and the internet didn't exist so i'm dating myself but that's true Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, well, I mean, one of my, some of my biggest inspirations are, you know, Professor uh, Andrew Huberman, the Huberman Lab podcast, like, I mean, that's science-based, you know, 
stuff. Uh, I know Joe Rogan can be a comedy, but he does have a lot of scientists on a lot that I do that I do like a lot. So there is there's a plethora of it, and we're trying to I'm trying to do more of the same, but for chemistry because I you know I'm trying to bring chemistry yeah. to the front forefront. Um, yeah, that's great. But so you're at Washington U, and I, this is another thing I was really interested in talking to you about is um, kind of decisions to go do a graduate, you know, to your PhD because I think you did you had an industry job for a little bit. Um, you're more than welcome to talk about that now, but at least your PhD, talking about that experience, because I knew you worked under John Burkall, Professor John Burkall, who, for people that obviously aren't in chemistry, I mean, he's a big name. I mean, um, and or again, metallic. Um, he's arguably uh, one of the biggest contrib- contributors for the Ziegler Nada um, mechanism, which is, I mean, how we how Americans make um, hundreds of billions of polyolefins a year. I mean, that's the process, and he's the one who's kind of at the forefront of mechanistic understanding. So, talk about that experience. You know, working for John Burkall and you know what you did as a as a graduate student. Sure. So you know, uh, when I graduated, uh, as I mentioned, I did my undergraduate research with Karen Woolley, who is a, mm. a fantastic polymer chemist. Uh, is also a, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. So um, uh, she taught me a lot about how people that are interested in synthesis and making molecules uh, can contribute to macromolecular sciences. And so mm. um, big molecules are tr- was th- that field was dominated by uh, engineers for the longest time because people were trying to make materials and look at the materials properties. And um, synthetic chemists were were not as kind of part of that equation. And mm. so there's a, I think still a big need for people interested in making molecules to contribute it, to make big molecules. Um, and so I like to make stuff and- um, Fair enough. I also very much enjoyed uh, kind of uh, physical organic nature of organometallic chemistry. When I took organometallic chemistry as a undergraduate student. Mm-hmm. And so kind of, uh, uh, when I got to, to Caltech, there are lots of, uh, which is where I went to graduate school. Yeah, I kind um, of mentioned There are a lot of fantastic people to work for there. It's kind of difficult to choose someone that's bad. Um, and so, right. uh, you know, it was a difficult decision, um, but I was really attracted to John's work because of the elegance in both the synthetic nature of his uh, research. So some of the very beautiful transition metal complexes that his lab has synthesized over the years Mm -hmm. uh, are, are uh, very, very nice synthetic uh, organic and synthetic inorganic chemistry, but also what you mentioned, the mechanistic understanding of these processes, I think really encapsulated me. Like how does, how does nature work and how do these, uh, 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 transition metal complexes interact? with uh, organic molecules to make useful things. And then I think ultimately um, I was very much interested in um, uh, environmental problems. And, you know, that, that at that time, as you mentioned, the polyolefin industries was huge and we had just been starting to uh, think about really employing biodegradable polymers and so on. Mm. And I think it was very important for me to understand and learn uh, from one of the experts in the world on how the polyolefins are being made so that you can try to mimic them and make something that maybe is more degradable. And that's a major part of my current research uh, program in sustainable polymers. Uh, But it was a fantastic experience uh, at Caltech. Uh, You know, I worked on a project that was kind of on the boundary of organic and inorganic chemistry. Uh, My project was to take these uh, chiral molecules, which are molecules that are like your hands. They have, you know, um, a left hand and a right hand and selectively reacting the left hand in the presence of the right hand. Um, And uh, the idea was to take the right hand of the the molecule and just make a big molecule out of it. And when Mm -hmm. you do that, it precipitates out. So then a filtration is the simple separation of the two hands of the molecule. And so that was my project. Mm. And it, it was really perfect for me because it combined my interest in inorganic and organic chemistry, which is kind of where I still kind of dabble. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, that's really that's really cool because actually one thing on the uh I think the Ziegler Nada um catalysis is that what I think is pretty interesting too is that it's it's a solid support, right? I think so it's zirconium it's and it's a heterogeneous reaction. That's correct. Yeah. There's there's not everything is not dissolved in solution. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it's this zirconium metal or and or titanium, I think. And I think a lot of people might I think a lot of people will find that really interesting is that titanium is another metal that is used to make these large, um, you know, really, these yeah. really plastics ultimately. Yeah. Um, in fact, so, uh, uh, that was John's most famous complex was one that is titanium. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it's not just a, it is a, um, that's how that's, I mean, that's how these plastics are, are formed. It's, it's this, uh, so what were some of your favorite, you know, experiences at graduate school. Like what were some of the, you know, what were some of the highs and what were some of the lows there? Yeah. I mean, certainly the, one of the highs was being around so many extremely talented people, mm -hmm. both in my lab, uh, my advisor, and also those in other labs and their advisors. Mm -hmm. um, Caltech is a, I think people that have been there will tell you it's a very special place because it's not very big. So um, it's only about 2000 students total of graduate students and undergraduate. So it's a very small place. Um, and so you get to know pretty much everyone pretty quickly. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so that intimate environment is really, and it coupled with the, the percentage of extremely intelligent people there is uh, can be very intimidating, but if you view it in the right way, if you're not trying to you know compare yourself to, to all these really smart people, you can really benefit from it. And I, that's, that's the route that I chose. Um, mm -hmm. So in fact, one of my, one of my, it's an interesting how it worked out. One of the students that was in John's group with me is currently a faculty member at Caltech. So Teo Agapie. Oh, cool. Lab mate. And so that, you know, <laughs> a little bit frust a bit um, um, humbling because, you know, he's a different level, uh, was a different level of thinking. And so I chose to just kind of learn from him and, and see what I can, what I can do. And so I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Um mm -hmm. The other thing is everyone's really passionate about what they're doing. Sure. So everyone's really excited. And so it's really fun to talk to everybody, you know, on Friday, Friday nights and stuff where we're always fun to talk about, Hey, this is what I discovered this week or whatever. Yeah. And that was really fun. I very much enjoyed uh, that experience. The Living in Pasadena, Pasadena is fantastic too. I've lived in a lot of great places and Pasadena is one of them. <sighs> and, uh, being in California and, and Southern, Southern California was great. I'm a, I'm an outdoors person. So I was able to do some hiking and, um, the Burkha group always went on a backpacking trip every summer. And so we would go to the high Sierras and go oh, wow. hike high Sierras with, with John. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a lot of fun. And, um, yeah. And, and I also met my wife in at, uh, Caltech. So that was hey, there you go. a great, um, a great thing. <laughs> That's awesome. The lows. Yeah. I mean, the lows, the lows, you know, the, I think the lows mostly, uh, were associated with kind of, you know, I was working very hard and and trying trying to be as productive as I could, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that got a little bit um, overwhelming. I think most graduate students kind of go through that period where they're like, "Oh, I have to go back into to lab again," and and um, I think I think uh, that there were some periods, but I I can't remember too many lows because they were they were broken up by a lot of of, of highs, mm -hmm. um, and so I don't have a lot of bad memories from those times. Yeah, I, I, even I'm beginning to notice it's like, like it's not like in my short time as a graduate student, it's not like there's not like a lot of lows. It's just like, you know, sometimes your reactions aren't working or, um, you know, you have a bit of a lull time. Yeah, you that, know? that could like, be frustrating. I, I agree with you, um, Aiden, that that especially early on, like you're not um, used to the, the, the success rate of research. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people have a misconception that everything just kind of falls into place uh, automatically. And that's not how it works. Uh, my colleague here, uh, Amir Hoveda, likes to compare it to baseball because he's a big baseball fan. And he's like, you know, if you're a good baseball player you, and you hit the ball 30% of the time, you know, you're, that's, that's good. All star. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. But in, in, in science, if you're doing it like six or 7% of the time, then you're like, no, like winning Nobel prizes. Right. So yeah. Right. It's just, it's just a lot of, 
you have to get used to like, well, that didn't work. And then mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't take it personally. And I think right. that's, that's a good thing to like, be like, all right, I, you know, nature has got secrets and sometimes you got to really work at it before she gives them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the things I remind myself and I, you know, other students do is like, just because, you know, your chemistry isn't working, doesn't make you a bad person. Right. That's you yeah. know, like, it's just what it is. I mean, well, also I think another thing Aiden is we don't like value the the negative results as mm. much as we should, right? So negative results can be uh, just as informative as positive results. Um, and so so uh, not knowing that something works is sometimes just as good as knowing something does work. Yeah. But we value the thing that does work, right? Because that's what we publish. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we talk about the most. But um, there should be, uh, I don't know how someone could start this, but there needs to be a journal of things that didn't work. So someone records everything and when you're doing a reaction and like, obviously like people have here subjects that worked here subjects that didn't work, but also to just like running like random experiments, like, I don't know, like in our case, like, uh, iron Suzuki coupling reactions. Okay. Here are the ligands that we tried here. Are the iron salts that we tried. Here's here's everything that didn't work and just put that in an article and publish that like that. Someone should do that. I think that there is be... a journal like that. Um, is that there? Exists. Yeah. The journal of failed research. I don't think that's what it's called. I can't remember the name of the, of the journal, but there mm. is such a journal um, out there. The problem is that it doesn't have a very high impact factor. Right. <laughs> and so the no one, no one, really, no one cares, I guess, sir. That's right. Um, but it's very important, not only uh, because it, it prevents people from repeating the same experiment, because probably if this, people have done the same failed experiment multiple times in different scenarios. Yep. But also because now, um, uh, with the uh, at the, ex the explosion of interest in applying um, AI to uh, solving scientific problems, mm -hmm. the data sets that you need for for effectively doing that are need to be huge and. Yep. just as important as the, the things that are productive are the things that are unproductive for those kinds mm. of things. And so there's a, I think there is uh, some momentum for, for people publishing all the things that they got to work and then all the things that didn't work for them as well. And the supporting mm. information, mostly for that latter, I think, uh, motivation, but I think it's, I think it's a really good point that you bring up. I hopefully, hopefully someone could take the, take the, uh, the forefront of that and really make that a thing. Um, I certainly, I'll do my due diligence say here, here's everything that didn't work with me, but. Well, I think it all, it also destigmatizes de the negative result, right? And mm -hmm. so people, I think for, I, ironically, could be a, a way to improve mental health for, for graduate students who are, who are going through that experience for the first mm -hmm. time, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's difficult um, to kind of overcome uh because it seems like there, there's no end to this, like, yeah, well, nothing's ever going to work, right? But um, I will say, too, like, a lot of times when, you know, when grad students join a group, I mean, sometimes it's just luck. Like, sometimes you join a group uh, that is on the verge of publishing or, you know, a verge of something, discovering something good, and you hop on that project right at that time. And, you know, they're cranking out high impact papers. And it's like, oh, wow, like, why can't I do that? Like, and it's right. just like, well, you know, and it's just, it's just part of the game, I guess. And I don't know, it is what it is. I, I know. I don't know how to like go and fix those issues. Maybe, maybe this doesn't need to be fixing. I'm just saying that, you know, I mean, more the state of think, it. Yeah. I don't think that that, uh, you know, you, you do that once and, and maybe you, you get a, pub, a publication or two. Um, but then if you go on to something else, like say that you go into a postdoc or your job, right. Mm. um over time right they're gonna that's not gonna happen over and over again right so right. i think true. eventually the the people with talent that 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 um can put themselves into positions where they're going to discover new things they mm. end up bubbling to the top and they end up being successful at the end of the day but in the very like you know time sensitive thing as, as graduate school or any one thing i think that's definitely yeah. true what you're saying is that sometimes people get are fortunate and uh end up doing those those things but mm. publishing and just celebrate it right so so right I always, tell, I always tell people look is it really important that we discover it um or is it important that it gets discovered right right that is a from, huge my, from my perspective yeah my perspective it's the latter 
right? So if someone discovers something really awesome, like, you know, you and I are working in similar fields, and if your your research ends up being something that we are, we're doing and you happen to publish it first, you know, um, I'm going to be excited about that because, you know, we discovered something as a community. And I think that's mm -hmm. much more important than uh, people knowing that, you know, yeah, who, 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 there's, there's an old idea of, you know, you want to be the first author, I think, I, I hopefully it's getting phased out, I don't really know, I, you know, what do I know, I'm a second year graduate student, but it seems to me, like, the idea of, you know, you want to be that first author on that paper, you, you want to be the one who's getting all these prizes, you know, whatever, it seems like it's, at least within my small community, it seems like it's kind of being phased out, where it's like, we're just happy that this is moving along in the right direction, and we're actually, like, making, you know, strides toward more sustainable, cheaper, cheaper metals, uh, more sustainable chemistry, you know, green chemistry, all those things, like we actually are moving that direction. Um, and it doesn't matter who, who publishes on it. Um, cause like you mentioned too, even if you're not the one who's like at the forefront of this, but you're still a talented scientist that like the talented scientists, it still comes out. The truth always you're gonna comes contribute. out. Like you, yeah. You're going to, you're going to be able to make a contribution and, mm -hmm. I think that's important, right? And so I think, uh, yeah, we need to celebrate those those successes whenever we can, and and mm -hmm. be confident that you know I know what I'm doing, and I'm going to be able to contribute at some point. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that 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 takes a little bit of, of faith uh, that that's mm -hmm. going to happen. But you know, um, yeah. So I, my, I, if you put if you put enough effort into it, and you're thinking carefully about what you're doing, I think you will make a contribution. I think anybody who does that will yeah ultimately sometimes it takes people to some people to put more effort into it than others mm -hmm. I and mean, that's just life but still um yeah that's just life that's not even just science right right um a lot of things you get out of it like you get out of it we put into it you know so yeah. that's like anything in life um so you did your uh, phd in organic john burke call caltech um you know what were some of the decisions going to do your uh postdoc with um uh, Tim Tim Jameson, right at MIT, who shame on me, I'm actually not as familiar with. So, um, you know, what was your work there? And what, like I mentioned, like what were some of the decisions like leading up to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Tim Jameson is an organic chemist mm -hmm. uh, who is a who really was at the time very well known for making uh, small molecule. Uh, large small molecules, so <laughs> making um, natural products and also developing new organic reaction me methodologies for synthesizing those natural products. Um, after kind of during my my postdoc, he started becoming well known for uh, trying to implement uh, flow chemistry into mm. organic molecules. And I think most people uh, today would recognize that as his is as a major contribution from the Jameson lab, but that kind of revolution happened while I was in po a postdoc. And so oh, wow. um, when I was, when I was a graduate student, um, I was again, wavering between joining uh, inorganic labs and organic labs. And so mm -hmm. um, I had my experience with very inorganic minded kind of chemistry. And what I wanted to do with my career was be at that border borderline so one of my heroes is was was bob grubbs right and so sure. bob has always been kind of on the border of organic and inorganic and even polymer chemistry and um i could have worked for bob i suppose but i i, I was more attracted to john at, at caltech and i wanted someone so when i for my postdoc i really wanted to work for someone that was not connected at all with that world mm. um and it gave me a very different perspective on chemistry and certainly tim jameson was that person uh, so I purposely chose any, someone that didn't have any ties to Caltech and also that was more of an organic chemist than an inorganic chemist so that I could try to learn skills that I didn't have already uh, coming yep. from John Burkhoff's group. So I, I think it was a bold move <laughs> to do that. Not very many people do that kind of thing uh, because there is the learning curve is very steep um, when you change fields that way. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think I learned a tremendous amount from my postdoc about uh, how organic chemists view uh, reaction development and mm. organometallic chemistry, even though my project was had not, no metals in it at all. So I was studying um, 
a reaction called a cascade reaction, which is a chemical reaction whose product then reacts again, kind of like a like a like a waterfall. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a really neat process. And uh, we were looking at the mechanism of this reaction that the Jameson groups uh, discovered and published in science, where water was the key ingredient to do this reaction in a way that couldn't be done before. Oh, and wow. it makes it makes a motif that is seen in a lot of natural products. Um, you may have heard of the red tide. Uh, this is a, a, a algae red bloom tide. that happens in um, the Pacific Ocean and, and many oceans that carries uh, very toxic um, toxins, uh, cytotoxins, mm -hmm. and or neurotoxins. Excuse me. And um, those neurotoxins are these really beautiful ladder-shaped molecules. Uh, called ladder polyethers. And mm -hmm. forever people were trying to figure out how these things were, were made. Uh, and there's this uh, hypothesis that uh, they're made through these cascade reactions. Um, and so the Jameson group had discovered that a key step uh, in doing the reaction to give you that structure requires water. And so basically my, my, my postdoc was to try to figure out why. And so I published a few papers with Tim on that subject and along the way gained skills and and understanding about you know natural product synthesis and also I did a I, I did a little bit of organic metallic chemistry in his his group uh, although we didn't publish anything um, just for fun and um, it was a great experience at MIT MIT and everyone asked me since I've been to both like to compare them and they're yeah, very right. different places the two um, they're both fantastic in their own ways. Uh, MIT is a lot bigger than Caltech, sure. uh, and so it's like I think I think it's six, five or six thousand undergrads and four mm -hmm. or five thousand something like that uh, grad students. So, you know, five times the size of Caltech, um, and the, it's on the East Coast rather than the West Coast, and so it's a very different kind of environment altogether. Um, but it was great uh, fun, and also another place was a, a high high proportion of people that are really intelligent. Mm -hmm. And that I had the uh, fortunate uh, opportunity to interact with and learn from. And so, yeah, that, I think that positioned me well to kind of uh, ultimately uh, get my job where I'm at now. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, uh, that is, I mean, as versatile as you can be, I don't know what more else you could have really done. I guess um, I could have done some biochemistry or physical chemistry, but. Sure. But as far as like, a, yeah, I mean, but like, I mean, that's still super impressive and just, I mean, really opening the doors to everything, I think. And Well, it certainly um, made my my job uh, applying for jobs a lot. I had a lot more jobs I could apply for. So I applied, sure. when I applied for uh, academic positions, I could apply for organic jobs and inorganic jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that was, I that was part of the strategy, actually, when I was applying for postdoc is that I knew that coming out of that, I would have that more versatile kind of um, opportunity when applying for academic positions. Mm -hmm. Now, just on, just on that, your, your postdoc research a little bit, because um, now I'm, now I'm curious about it is so making these, I guess I could describe them as natural products. Um, um, so what was the role of water to make those natural products? Like, um, can you explain that again one more time? What, what yeah. kind of, what kind of so, compounds were they again? It, it, it's it, they're called ladder polyether natural products okay and the uh the there's a common motif they're, they're really big molecules uh, some of the mm -hmm. biggest natural products um and famous uh, organic chemists like casey nicolau who is sure. at scripts ha have been trying have been making them in like 50 steps or 60 steps like one bond at a time but a common mm -hmm. motif in them is an oxygen carbon carbon oxygen carbon, carbon, oxygen, carbon, carbon, oxygen, right? And so that uh, um, motif, you can, if you think about it retrosynthetically, you can break it down to being a, a, an, an alcohol followed by a, a, the carbons that attacks an epoxide. And so then that mm -hmm. epoxide opens, which can then attack another epoxide. Um, I see. And so that's called the, the that's the cascade reaction. But like looking at I'm epoxide, looking these images the, right the role of water, right? Epoxide for for your your maybe your folks that aren't familiar with that's carbon, 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 and then there's a it's a three membered ring with an mm -hmm. oxygen, and it's really because of that three membered ring 
it's it's very reactive because it's a very um, strained molecule. And so the problem that when you have that 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 a classic thing in or that you learn in sophomore organic chemistry when you're a sophomore in in undergraduate is that the epoxy can either attack one carbon or the other, right? And usually it's dictated by how many substituents are on the epoxide and whether you're using an acid or a base. But what was interesting about this, um, these epoxides is that they were, they were substituted the same on each side. So there was no bias for the reaction occurring on one side or the other. Mm. And what, what the Jameson group discovered before I got there was that by combining uh, kind of the, a precursor to these natural products, they called a template, with doing these epoxide opening reactions in water led to selective mm -hmm. attack of the oxygen at one side of the uh, of the uh, epoxide versus the other. And what was really astounding was that normally is not the way that epoxide openings go. So it made a six membered ring rather than a, a five membered ring. So generally speaking, when you have that competition, five membered rings win. Mm -hmm. So this is something called the Baldwin rules for uh, ring opening reactions. Um, and so this was very kind of exciting because not only did it, was it doing something that didn't normally do, but it also ended up giving the same structure as those uh, natural products. Mm -hmm. So, and, and water was the key to success. So what was happening was the water was kind of, the, there's two things that are involved. The, the, the template is very important too. So that's a, another six member ring mm -hmm. that. Uh, interacted with the water to organize the substrate for the uh, um, alcohol molecule uh, moiety to attack the epoxide to do the ring opening. So it's a very intricate. Ultimately, we just we figured out that it was a um, an intricate interplay between the hydrogen bonding of water and the template to organize the uh, molecule appropriately for the cyclization reaction. That was a really fun. Uh, so. It's really weird. I, my entire like, graduate's career, I was trying to my best not to expose my reactions to water. <laughs> and then my postdoc, right. everything I did was in water. <laughs> Actually cool. Now, was, was, was it also in continuous flow though too? Was that also continuous flow? That wasn't a flow project, no. Okay. The flow, the flow chemistry came about as a completely different project that, that um, I just happened to be in the group Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, uh, Tim, Tim started, uh, his group started investigating um, using flow chemistry to make complex molecules mm -hmm. uh, in a single step. Uh, one one That's thing I, I want to, yeah. Sense. One thing I want to ask you though about the, um, I guess the the mechanistic understandings of um, that work is, wh so what is, I'm going to, um, what is the significance of that? Because I feel yeah. like I, 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 while I don't say this stuff, um, people will say, oh, well, you're just making natural products. Like who uses these natural products, especially you were just saying that's a top, it's a toxic, yeah. um, compound. So why are we trying to make these things? Well, right, a lot so. of toxins, a lot of toxins end up, if you make modifications to those toxins, well, they're toxins because they interact with the, with biology, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you can modify them so that they are no longer disruptive for key functions, they can actually be beneficial. So there's a, a fine line between uh, molecules that are bad for us and molecules that are good for us. Yeah, right. And sometimes it's just, it just, it's just, so if you find, mo if you're studying molecules that interact with the human body, even if it's in a detrimental way, mm -hmm. there that, that just tells you that the molecule is, it, ha it has the right properties to interact with parts of the of biology so you know um there's there's interest in the, these molecules because you, you can modify them and you know temper their 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 neurotoxicity and use them for uh beneficial purposes and i think that's one of the reasons why um uh but also i think there it's it's important to understand how biology makes all these really complicated molecules mm -hmm. Um, because if let's say you wanted to, maybe there's a way that we can prevent that from happening. And hmm. so if there is one of these algae blooms, maybe we have some, some solution to that, mm -hmm. right? So, oh, we just need to disrupt that pathway and then that won't happen anymore. Right. And so, uh, 
that could be very beneficial from a human health standpoint because then um if these if if we notice oh that the algae bloom starting we can maybe do something to right. disrupt the pathway that makes the toxin and then there wouldn't be any toxins on the, on the beach and stuff and so that's another mm -hmm. reason why i think uh it's important yeah i think uh it's very it's not helpful to say that these many compounds are toxins right because uh, to people that aren't uh really, I mean, scientists, I guess they'd say it's like, oh, they're toxins, like they're, they're bad for us, but we can actually learn a lot from them. And so that's definitely a uh, unfortunate way that of phrasing it. But just know that like, just because they are toxins doesn't mean that we can't learn uh, from, you know, things from it, uh, broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. um, so question for you then is, so you did your postdoc there with a lot of great experiences, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of learning. How does that transform into getting a becoming a professor? Because I, I I can't imagine that you grew up you wanting to be a professor, right? So how does no. this how does this kind of take shape and and come full yeah, circle? So I think I had a pretty typical kind of arc in terms of like career path. When I was an undergraduate student, I didn't even know I was going to be a chemist, right? First, and then once right. I started being a chemist, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll probably get an industry job uh, out of my out of college sure. and, I, and I had a great TA actually in one of my organic chemistry classes that was like you should go to a graduate school you're gonna you would be a great graduate student and so I started thinking about that and then with encouragement from you know my my uh, my professors I, I went to graduate school but I really the the idea of becoming a professor really struck me somewhere uh, in graduate school when um, I start, because because one of the great things about working in John Burkhoff's group is he's very academic. Like he thinks about things from a fundamental standpoint, very much interested in things and how it works. But yet his research, as you mentioned, is very applied. So we interacted very frequently with industry. So there was a huge another project going on at that time that BP was involved with. And so mm -hmm. BP would come and I would get to enter. I had the opportunity to interact with the with folks at BP. So I had a really good understanding kind of, and I also, as you mentioned, I worked in industry for a year between undergraduate and graduate school. And I kind of understood the difference in terms of like what the benefits and uh, of each kind of area. Mm -hmm. And I was leaning more towards academia, mostly because I was drawn to the uh, really attractive idea of like, okay, if I don't like, I, I want to work on this. And if I can get funding for that, I will, which is not trivial, um, uh, then I, I, I'll be able to, to work on it. But also excitingly is if I don't, I'm not interested in working on it anymore, I can just stop. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what, that's one of the great things about being in academia is that you kind of control your destiny in terms of what you're interested in, in working on. And that is not true in industry. So when you join an industrial company, Unless you're calling the shots for the for for the company, and if you're doing that, you're not near the bench. And I like doing stuff at the bench. I like right. doing the experiments or being close to the experiments. Then you kind of need to do what the company needs you to do. And so you may be hired to do one thing, um, but then six months later, the the profit margins or whatever the the um, they ain't there no the more. Company, the, the the business side of the company decides that's not. The way hey, we're going a different direction oh, we're going to yeah. go something else and you're like all right i have two choices i can just go with the flow and do whatever they want me to do or i can quit my job and do another job and neither of those yeah. options seem so exciting to me um even though they're much more lucrative so working in the chemical industry generally speaking you make more money than working in academia Mm -hmm. And then the final thing I want to say about that decision is I really love teaching. So that's a big part of my job as well that I think a lot of research scientists don't talk about as much, but it is important um, and something that I take a lot of uh, joy out of and, and uh, going in, in an industry job while you still get the teaching and mentoring, it's not the same as teaching, you know, uh, college age students. And then finally, I think the other factor was I really loved being in college. When I was in college, that was when I really like going, yeah, college is awesome. And I was <laughs> like, I want to I wanna stay in college as long as I possibly can. And this was a sure. strategy for me to do that, to be quite frank with you without being creepy, right? So 
Yeah, um, so I know what you mean. I like the environment. I like the age. Like college age students are so excited, and it's such a fun time in 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 uh, someone's life. And mm-hmm. being part of that as long as possible was really appealing to me. So those that those yeah. were the factors that really kind of pushed me towards academia. Yeah, professorship is definitely a. Uh, I mean, I always thought about like I would love to do. I see. I don't know how interested I am in being like a research based, but I I would love to teach. Like I I love teaching. I you know I love uh, working hands on and you know helping students out and really showing people what chemists really can do and the applications of it. Um, I don't know how I'd feel about writing grants and stuff like that one day. I don't know. Maybe my opinion will change, but, um, I think, I think, um, professorship is really, really, really rewarding. Honestly, I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, but just on your professorship now, this kind of brings us to a good point because this is an area that I'm very passionate about. Um, you, your research is pretty diverse. Um, but at least one that I'm particularly interested is your work in, and we're going to, we're going to do our best to work people through this is, uh, Suzuki Miura cross coupling reactions, um, carbon sp3, carbon sp2, and um, I don't know if you, I don't know if we want to give a brief background for that. Um, perhaps we should, um, but like, he, he, I'm going to try and do my best here to explain this a little bit. You can okay. definitely hop in. Great, I'm but, looking forward to it. So, carbon carbon bond formation is fundamentally. I mean, it's. It's really important. I'll just say that. Um, in 2010, um, Suzuki, Heck, and um, Nagishi won the Nobel Prize for their work in palladium catalyzed um, carbon carbon bond uh, cross coupling reactions. And while we can talk to the end of time and who deserved the Nobel Prize, the point is that carbon carbon bond formation is important. But also, it utilizes a lot of palladium. And Palladium, I mean, it's arguably the best metal because it does everything, and it's very robust in functional group tolerance. Um, but the problem is, it's 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 well, it's expensive, and in in the industry point of view, its purifying processes can be pretty cumbersome and expensive. So ideally, you'd like to replace uh, palladium with base metal catalysis, so using nickel, iron, and copper. I would even say ideally iron because iron gives you the most, um, well, one is, I think it might be the cheapest, but also the least toxicity issues. Um, yeah. So you yeah, don't have to be as rigorous. That's right. So palladium is expensive, but it's also toxic. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, and then we're running out of it. So um, yep. that's another thing that is important. And I think, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong this, but, Palladium deposits. There's, I don't, I don't know if there's any in America. I don't know. Maybe there are some, not. but it's in well, Russia, right? Russia and, and and Africa. Uh, right. I think are where most uh, palladium is. I believe. I'm not an expert mm-hmm. in that area, but it's yeah. So there's some. There is definitely some. There's a political. Uh, uh, definitely, yeah. A so so the move away from that, that. and that's important because you know uh, I think. Uh, these processes that you mentioned that won the Nobel Prize, the one reaction that's used the most in the pharmaceutical industry is the reaction developed by Suzuki and mm-hmm. his uh, uh, student, Mayora. And uh, that single reaction is responsible for something like 30% of all carbon-carbon bonds made in the pharmaceutical industry. So it is a yep. it is a very important reaction to make drug molecules. But... Mm-hmm. Um, as you mentioned, you have to purify those drug molecules and that raises the expense, but also you have to invest in the palladium. And so this, this political issue you, you bring up often leads to fluctuations in the, in the bait, in the price of that metal. And that's tough mm-hmm. because the pharmaceutical company wants to operate a certain, you know, profit margin. And if the cost of the drug depends on the cost of the catalyst that, to make the drug, right, they have two choices, either they keep the cost level and take a hit on their profit margin, or they kind of parallel the market of the palladium with the cost of the drug. And no one, no, no one who takes drugs regularly wants fluctuations in, in drug prices, right? right? High drug prices are terrible, of course. Everyone's low drug prices. But um equally frustrating for for somebody is I got to pay ten dollars this month, but then next month I got to pay a hundred dollars. Like what the heck? Because yeah. it's hard for planning. And so 
it's a kind of a rough situation when you have that scenario. And so th I think that that is an important, what you said there, I think is a very important thing that's under undervalued. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to a metal, like you mentioned iron, if you could do similar reactions with a more abundant metal like iron and one that is not toxic. So we have iron coursing through our veins, literally mm -hmm. um, in, in uh, hemoglobin, right? So uh, then you solve kind of two big problems, multiple, multiple big problems. Yeah. So, it's sorry, a very You're doing a great no, job. I've, it's, I think, I mean, we hit all the nails on the head. I think it, it would, the bottom line is moving towards base metal catalysis. I would argue specifically iron uh, because it's just so abundant and it's so dirt cheap. It's literally the price of dirt. Like, um, that would be advantageous to do all these pharmaceutical chemistry. So let's get into that. Let's get into your research. So basically you take, um, let's, let's see how to describe this electrophiles, which is where electrophiles, um, aryl halides is the one in the reacting partner and is one piece. The other piece is, uh, this, um, boron reagent. And so those are the coupling partners and that is facilitated by your metal. That's basically what it boils down to, I think. Um, and so you developed these, uh, your group developed these beta diketamate ligands to, um, I guess, you know, uh, which surround the metal that's, and keeps it stable, I guess. I don't know if there's a way to, I think it's a fair yeah, way to so describe it. That's right. That's right. I think, um, one thing you mentioned that I, I, I did want to maybe add on to was you said palladium can do everything, but that's not true. Mm. Uh, actually, these palladium complexes, uh, they can put together molecules that are very flat so that uh, involve mm. sp2 hybridized carbons really well. Yep. Um, but they have a harder time when the molecule has more three dimensionality to them. So that very good point. Yeah. Yep. Hybridized carbons. And so because of the prevalence of using this reaction in the pharmaceutical industry and that limitation, there, if you look at the, the, the dimensions of most drug molecules, so you can go Google like the top 100 small molecule drugs, most of them are very flat molecules, right? And part of that is the, is the limitation of using palladium for these reactions. Yet, if you look at natural products and, the, and these molecules that I study as a, as a graduate a postdoc, right? Mm -hmm. Those molecules have much more three-dimensional to them right. because they incorporate more of those sp3 hybridization, hybridized carbon. So there's this idea in the pharmaceutical industry that um, we're not accessing all the chemical space that we could potentially use to treat, to treat patients because yeah. of our dependence on this method. And so people call that uh, flatland, and and there's mm. this movement to escape from flatland. Flatland. Yeah, what's there's a paper right? it's like escaping from yeah, flatland. It's a fantastic titles, escape from flatland. I wish I could come yeah. up with something that uh, <laughs> eye catching, um, but um, I think using it turns out using these first row transition metals, these base metals, uh, I think the pioneer in this area that we have to mention is Greg Fu's chemistry at, at yep. uh, Caltech, who was at MIT and then moved to Caltech. Um, he was a very important contributor for just showing that by using these first row transition metals, he was using nickel, mm -hmm. you can escape from flatland. And so I think in addition to these economic and, and safety issues, there's this big advantage for using these metals from a, a chemistry standpoint. And I think mm -hmm. that's important to mention. And so yep. uh, speaking of our chemistry, right, one of the things that's interesting about this Suzuki reaction that is unique to that reaction is that you have to add base to the reaction. Um, and very people have been debating what's the role of the base in the in this reaction for a very long time. Um, and what we realized was that the base bases that were being used for palladium are things like sodium alkoxide or sodium hydroxide. They lead to palladium hydroxides. And so mm -hmm. palladium is on the right hand side of the periodic table. And there's a trend the, that um, elements that are on the right-hand side of the periodic table don't bind very tightly to oxygen. But as you move to the left in the periodic table, and iron is to the left of palladium in the periodic table, then um, those metals become a lot more oxophilic. So they bind very tightly to oxygen. And so we had this hypothesis uh, when we started in this chemistry 
um, iron was used for cross-coupling reactions, but not for the Suzuki cross-coupling reaction. Mm -hmm. And we thought that the reason why that people had, we haven't been using them as iron isn't very useful is because people were using the same bases that they were using for palladium and using them for iron. Mm. And those kinds of bases then lead to very strong bonds to iron that then recruit other irons. So, you know, you have to remember what the big uh, kind of sink for all iron complexes is. And, and everyone is experienced. Iron oxide. Yeah. Rust. Rust is the, you know, you, you put nail in the, in the rain and the oxygen, you're going to get rust. So iron, and that's iron oxide. So, and that's because oxygen and iron love each other. So you have to prevent that from happening. And so we discovered that if you replace those bases with um, nitrogen based bases, so amide mm -hmm. bases, that the iron nitrogen bonds are weaker. Also, there's three, there's two uh, things on uh, amines instead of just one and an, an alcohol. Mm -hmm. And that prevents the iron from aggregating. And that we think is the key to getting these reactions to work efficiently. That's really cool. That was kind of our, our entry into that whole thing. Uh, and and our, our big kind of contribution, I suppose, to the, the field of uh, cross-coupling catalysis mm -hmm. that enabled these very reactive uh, species to be uh, to be used for this very useful reaction. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to pick your brain out because I know you got to go soon is uh, is some people someone might ask then okay well if palladium is so expensive and we want to move towards why don't and we want to move towards these base metals why weren't we at these base metals in the first place like yeah. this is and this is something I talked to my PI about I was like I don't that's something I don't really completely understand it's like you know why why is palladium at the forefront of all this of all this stuff and it's like well. I don't, I don't really know. I don't really have a good answer for that. I don't know why it was. It's very interesting. So if you look at the history of these cross-coupling reactions, um, the the uh, Stille cross-coupling reaction was was the first palladium catalyzed reaction. So Stille did not win the Nobel Prize, but that's because Stille tragically died in the mm. in, in the 1980s, uh, I think, because that, that's the decade. Um, and you can't win the Nobel Prize posthumously. So mm. um, I think this is one of the reasons why the Nobel Prize took so long to be awarded for these coupling reactions is because they're like, well, we Nobody. can't give it to Stille, right? And he was the, one, of the, one of the pioneers in palladium catalyzed cross-coupling reactions. So um, shout out to Stille. But he discovered cross palladium catalyzed cross-coupling reactions in 1978. Mm -hmm. um, seven years earlier, there, there was a chemist named uh, Jay Kochi who okay. yep, yep, yep. published an iron catalyzed cross-coupling reaction in 1971. So almost a decade earlier, iron was being used. And if you look in the literature even earlier, there's this famous uh, chemist named Karash. Yep. Um, and he published some some chemistry that looks like cross-coupling reactions. Like iron, iron trichloride. Yep. In 1945. <laughs> yep. So much earlier. So what that, what gives? Like going back to your question, why, why not iron? And so I've thought about this a lot. And I think that there's two reasons why. One reason is um, palladium reactions, and if you uh, look at the mechanisms for these reactions, mm -hmm. um, they palladium only can exist in uh, mostly, most commonly exists in two oxidation states, zero and two. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the reactions that, um, the, the mechanisms of these reactions require the oxidation state of the metal to change. And um, when you go when you can only go from zero to two, it simplifies things greatly. If you think about sure. the chemistry of iron, iron can exist in many different oxidation states. It's fairly common for zero, two, three. There are examples of four and five and- Negative so, two. <laughs> if get... And also chemical reactions are known to occur by one or two electron processes. Mm -hmm. So I think that that there was this, um, uh, it would be great to talk to someone like John Burkaw about this because he was around for this time period and he was active, research active during this time period, the late 70s, early 80s. But I think that there was this thinking that um, mechanistically speaking, the first row transition metals, because they are have this dichotomy, like it could be one electron processes or two electron processes. And then on top of that, there's something called spin. And so mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the number of unpaired electrons can change that there were just too many pathways. And so that inherently would make these um, kinds of metals more promiscuous. So they would they would just go all over the place and it'd be harder to understand mechanistically and harder to develop 
logically uh, a catalyst to, for the reaction. So I think that was a, a major thing that was the thought of the time. Um, and there were just some crazy people like Kochi, right? And Karash that were like, whatever, we can still do these, react, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and then the other thing I think that's very important to understand is that in, around that same time period was the rise of NMR spectroscopy for mm. studying um, organic molecules. So um, NMR is a, a nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. I don't know if you've talked about this on your podcast uh, before. Not in detail, but it's very similar but, to people like MRI, basically. That's it's, right. Uh, it's like MRI for molecules. And so uh, one of the neat things you can get from nuclear magnetic resonance imaging is structural information about molecules. And mm -hmm. this is very difficult to do. Um, but one of the things that um, uh, some of the the the, the the features of an NMR spectrum that you would get <clears throat> are vastly uh, complicated when you have a molecule that has unpaired electrons in it. Mm -hmm. You can still do NMR spectroscopy for paramagnetic compounds, but the rules that, that again, you would learn in a, a sophomore organic chemistry class don't necessarily apply. Um, and so some of the, the, the things that you use to kind of deduce the structure of a diamagnetic compound you can't necessarily use for a paramagnetic compound. Right. And so people are like, oh man, I can't. And in fact, some people say un un unrightly that you can't do NMR spectroscopy on paramagnetic compounds. So um, people are like, well, I can't use NMR. Ah, I think I'm going to study this palladium compound. Those are all right. diamagnetic compounds. And I, I think I, have a, I can then use NMR spectroscopy to, um, to, to try to understand the intermediates in this reaction. And so I think that that's another reason why um, there was this people kind of decided to develop palladium catalyzed uh, cross coupling reactions. I don't think that there was the insight that these reactions would be enormously useful for the pharmaceutical industry right at the onset when people were making right. those decisions. Um, because at that time, also, we were still trying to understand fundamental transformations in organometallic chemistry. Um, and so the applications pro probably didn't become more evident until the the, the, the late 80s. Um, for it's classes. also that, that's it's my so hypothesis. I, it'd be great to chat with a historian, an organometallic historian. Yeah, like Jay Labinger at at, at uh, Caltech um, would be a good person to talk to about that. Mm -hmm. uh, who knows a lot about the history of organometallic chemistry? But that's my hypothesis for that. Yeah. Um, One last thing I'll say is probably also. Back in the 19, I mean, 60s to 80s, palladium also wasn't expensive as it is now. That's true. Probably, Although, you know. uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure when catalytic converters really became popular, but that's mm -hmm. the major use for palladium today, right? And that drives the right. cost up for palladium. So it'll be interesting, yeah. you know, one thing as we move to electric vehicles that don't use catalytic converters, does that mean palladium prices are going to go down? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see, I suppose, but... Um, yeah, we'll see. Time will tell. Yep. But Professor Bias, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. I, oh, for sure. I really enjoyed this this conversation. Um, and from the sound of it too, I I have more questions to ask. Um, so sometime in the future we'll get you back on here because I, I definitely want to pick your brain more. Um, about because I saw also your paper on the dozy. I I didn't really get a chance to read that one yet, but um, there's a lot more that I have questions about. And just want to thank you again for your time. And uh, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Aiden. Alrighty, alrighty, folks. Good to see you. Oh, 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 oh,